Welcome everyone to the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. This is the first session installment of Art Gottlieb's lecture on the 20th century by decade part two. I would like to take a moment and thank our sponsor for this program, the Friends of the Library. Now, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Art Gottlieb. Hi everyone, good to see you. Happy almost spring. Um, I have um, um, 11 bullet points today for you that I'm going to be discussing. And like always, our hour and a half is going to go by like this. Um, I don't know how old some of the people in my audience are. Maybe you're a little bit older than me. Maybe you're a little younger than me. Maybe you're my age. Um, but the 1950s, even though I was born one day before 1950. I don't remember the 1950s, right? Yet, I guess that the decade that I grew up in, at least as a child, the 1960s, um, and then as a teenager in the 1970s, was based, quite frankly, on the, a lot of things that happened here in this period. Uh, it's a very, very important period of time, just like every decade was, is I have um, my bullet points are this today for the 1950s. We'll be starting off with the Korean War and the, the importance of the Marshall Plan in Europe. Um, and this isn't in chronological order, um, but I want to talk about the importance of Russia being able to develop a missile system and launching Sputnik into space, which is something that happened in the summer of 1957. Um, the beginnings of the peaceful use of nuclear power in the form of atomic energy in not only shipborne propulsion, but also power stations. And the invention of something that we pretty much take for granted here, which is transistors and semiconductors um, replacing, you know, I don't know how many of you know what a tube is. Um, anybody who used to like to work on you know, old TV sets or radios or anything electronic remembers vacuum tubes. Uh, today, of course, everything is the microchip. And the beginning of that revolution, of course, occurred in the 1950s uh, in semiconductors like transistors. Um, the advent of the next step in nuclear war, which was the hydrogen and all that pertained. The Eisenhower interstate system, which if you didn't, if you never heard it by that term, uh, all of the highway systems that we have, uh, the interstate highway is like I-84, I-95, just to name a couple. Um, that is all something that was created and developed during the 1950s. Uh, certainly has changed the landscape and our lifestyles here in the United States. Um, the advent and real proliferation of televisions into as a consumer item into people's homes. Um, I mean, of course, today we take for granted things like, you know, the computer screens we're on right now. And of course, I can watch any kind of streaming activity or movie or television if I want to right from my smartphone. But having a TV in your very own living room, well, that was a big deal in the 1950s. The polio vaccine, uh, something I don't even think about. I mean, talk about take for granted, the polio vaccine. Um, we'll talk about how the world has changed with vaccinations like this it occurred in the 1950s. Uh, um, how about Crick and Watson developing the ability to map DNA? Now, that changed everything. And the beginning of it, of course, was in the 1950s. And uh, finally, um, something many of us are familiar about, rock and roll music, um, or at least I think you're familiar with it. Rock and roll music with some great stuff from the 1950s, certainly going into the 1960s, right? So I'm gonna begin at the beginning. Um, 1950 was still considered 
to be the immediate post-war era, World War II. And therefore, there was a certain mood in the country that was a peace dividend from the fact that the United States had survived not only intact, but had emerged in um, the immediate post-war era, 1946, 1947, 1948, as the only real country standing that hadn't had its infrastructure de destroyed. We were bombed, of course, on Pearl Harbor, but that was a localized event. Um, the United States steel industry, our electronics industry, our infrastructure as far as railroads and delivery systems were all quite intact. And not only that, but well lubricated from having this massive buildup during World War II of every possible thing, creating more tanks than any other country had ever produced, aircraft, vehicles. Um, we were ready to shift right over to uh, consumer products, and we did. And um, the military was downsized very, very rapidly. Uh, one of the hallmarks of American war fighting was we just wrapped up everything that we had created and just put it away after every single war. Um, that was true of the, certainly of the Civil War. Um, the Spanish-American War wasn't a big military buildup, but um, certainly was true after World War I. Um, in the 1920s, we wrapped up everything. And by the time World War II rolled around, we once again found ourselves unprepared. So there was a tremendous amount of hardware and materials that were left over at the end of World War II. And we put it all away in ships that I used to work on in the mothball fleets, uh, the reserve fleets of the Navy down in the James River, the Nor Norfolk, Chesapeake Bay area, also in Philadelphia is mostly where I spent my time working on those things. And we had literally thousands of ships and aircraft all over the place. Um, we, in the 1950s, we had actually sold much of this to our ally countries. We sold submarines to Argentina, cruisers. We sent them to Greece. We sent them to Turkey. Um, so American hardware was actually ubiquitous around the world in that time period. But by 1950, there were a number of things that were life changers and world changers in the political military scene. First of all, most dramatically, China had finished its civil war, right, which had been going on since the early part of the 20th century. And the communists reigned supreme. And our allies from World War II, Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese nationalists were driven off to the island of uh, Formosa, now called Taiwan, of course. And obviously the tensions and thereabouts of our allies being on Taiwan still reverberates today, as you're aware from current events. And the Chinese going communist was a big deal during this time. Uh, Harry Truman got hammered relentlessly for his having let China go communist, right? Which, you know, might be a, an unfair criticism. I mean, after all, um, it, we, we have this notion that if something happens during a president's time, well, while he's in office, obviously it's his fault, you know. So um, whether that be right at the moment or it was a hundred years ago. I just did a program on Herbert Hoover and I asked my audiences, what do you know about Herbert Hoover? Oh, he caused the Great Depression, right? Because the Great Depression, the stock market crash happened during Herbert Hoover's time. Therefore, it's his fault. Um, Harry Truman left office with very low approval ratings. And one of the main reasons was this thing we call the second communist scare, the second communist scare. And the first one was in the 1930s. The second one was in the 1950s. And that's what was going on. We, were, we saw communists everywhere. 
They were under the desk. They were in the garage. They were in the back seat of your car while you were driving around. And of course, we wound up with something called, which isn't on my list, but should have been on my list, McCarthyism. That still reverberates with us today on both sides of the political spectrum, right? So if you're thinking that you're too worried about some foreign element taking over our government, that makes you a conspiracy theorist. Because look what happened to McCarthy. He turned out to be a caricature by the end of his witch hunt as far as finding communists everywhere in Hollywood and all the rest of that. And at the other end of the spectrum, well, how do you know there aren't communists who have infiltrated the government and want to flip the capitalism into a, into a socialist government from the standpoint of worldwide socialism? Uh, which, after all, was the stated goal of communism in the Communist Manifesto, you see. So you could ask questions about uh, the Manchurian candidates of the world um, today or back in these days or even in the 1930s, right? Communism was a big bugaboo because it essentially put an end to or sought to put an end to our way of life about having the kind of independence we have and certainly any kind of God-centric society, right? Because the communist country relies upon the government being the central figure replacing God as we would have it in our founding documents. Um, and of course, there's much discussion about that today as well. So the Korean War starts in the summer of 1950, right? Right out of the box. And let me just give you a quick background on this. <clears throat> Our decade is kicked off with a big, not just a communist scare about our own country. I mean, back in those days, Korea was an awfully far away place. You know, remember today we live with the internet and computers. So, you know, somebody half the world away is only a keystroke away. Back in 1950, I mean, Korea might as well have been on the face of the moon, you know, as far as people's sensibilities of it, et cetera. And the war was over as far as World War II was concerned, right? So the question is, do we need to involve ourselves in some kind of a war? And it was a similar discussion that you hear people talking about, like that it might be applicable. It's not a perfect analogy, but like, I don't know. Do we need, really need to be spending billions of dollars in Ukraine? You know, that sort of a thing. It was it was we have to kind of transport ourselves to that period of time. And the notion was, is that for people who lived during that era and were in the service was, well, we fought the real foes worth dying for. We we vanquished the Nazi regime. And clearly that was worth dying for. And um, in the Pacific, we went and we got those uh, people who had attacked us at Pearl Harbor, right? Which we had kind of a personal vendetta against, not because they were Asians, but because they had sucker punched us, which was a big honor violation. And of course, Imperial Japan was expansionist and quite oppressive. Um, so in 1950, people wanted to get on with their lives. And uh, my father was in the uh, Naval Reserves and he got called up. And I understand he wasn't all so pleased with it. But the interesting thing about this, and I'll just tell you this quick story because it, is, it really makes a good point, right? So my father was in the Navy and he got called up for the mobilization of Korea because he was in the reserves. He's still a young man. And... You know where they sent him? Morocco. They sent him to Morocco. And the point is um, that because the Korean War had started, the United States had considered that only to be the first shoe to drop, the one in Korea. We were expecting and always were expecting the Russians to use that what was supposed to be a decoy of Korea to bring our attention out to the Far East while the Russians broke out of East Germany 
and actually went to conquer the rest of Europe. And so that's why we actually had a larger military buildup during the Korean War era in the Mediterranean and on the European continent than anything that we had in the Far East. We were really expecting the war to break out, the real war to break out in Europe. And the United States was not prepared for this at all. Uh, there was this tremendous mobilization of getting those ships I was telling you about and the aircraft out of mothballs and getting them upgraded immediately because we really had, we, we only had a shoestring to work on in the Pacific when the Korean War broke out. Now, what had happened here exactly was the at the end of World War, War II, as you know, the Pacific War had ended um, many months after the European War. The, the European War in Germany had ended in May of 1945. And the uh, Pacific War uh, was over in August, right? So that's only a few months, but that few months was a real was a real learning experience for the Western allies vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. And we realized in Europe that the Russians were not planning on giving back any single landmass or area that they had taken on the way to Berlin. And that became quite clear. You know, where they went, they were staying. Um, and the United States, not wanting to be a colonial power, or at least not an overt colonial power, was we're just here for the war. And as soon as the war is over, we're out of here. Or as soon as the government, especially the government of Germany, is back on their own feet, then we have no need to be here. We're not looking to conquer a country so we can have the country. And But the Russians, that's not what their point of view was. They wanted to take every single landmass that they acquired on the way to Berlin, and they intended to keep it. And um, so when the Pacific War occurred, right, the end of the Pacific War, between the time of the two droppings of the atomic bomb and August 6th and August 9th, respectively, the second one initiating the end to the war. Between those two periods of time, which were only three days apart, the Russians declared war on Japan after essentially the whole thing was over, right? There was a possibility before the Japanese surrendered that we might still have to invade Japan, and that's what we're planning was. So at that point, the Russians would have been, it would have been advantageous to have them as a land, as an army. You see, we had planned that from Potsdam onwards, uh, the Potsdam conference. But the Russians, we knew, were going to come through Siberia into Manchuria and then take everything that they could possibly take under the guise of fighting the, their now enemies, the, the Japanese. Right. So they had taken this tremendous amount of land. And even after the fighting stopped, the, the Russians kept taking land in the uh, Pacific region. So when the war was officially over, we did not want to have a divided Japan as we had divided Germany. Right? Germany was divided into four occupation zones, the Russian occupation zone, the British, the American and the French. And there was no way that the United States was going to allow, no way, Japan to be divided with us having to deal with the Russians the way we already had to deal with the Russians in Germany. You see, and we had a kind of a personal thing with Japan anyway. After all, like I said to you before, it was Japan that attacked us. So we felt is it was our due having the Pacific been mostly an American war against the Japanese. Not completely fair because the British were there too, uh, having suffered deeply in Burma and Malaya. But Japan was ours. But yet the Russians had to be conceded as somebody who was on our side, the Allies' side. Which brings us to Korea. Now, Korea, the peninsula of Korea, which is roughly the size of California, 
was actually annexed by Japan in 1905, right? So Korea didn't have a government. It was only an occupied place and a colonized place by Japan. So once Japan was vanquished, there was no government and there was no previous government. You see, at least in Germany, there was a government before the Nazi government, you see? So you couldn't but leave the Nazis in charge. So we had to come in and sort of stay there until new non-Nazis were running Germany again. Not That wasn't even available in Korea. There was nobody to run Korea now that the Japanese were vanquished. So instead of having the Russians have any access to Japan, right, for reasons I just mentioned, we, the United States, told Russia they, they could administer the northern half of Korea and the United States would administer the southern half of Korea, right? And there was an arbitrary line drawn at the 38th parallel, which is, you know, roughly in the center of the country. So, and of course, the Russians put in a government that resembled their government, which was a communist government. And we put in a government that resembled our government, which was a democratic government. And we were supposed to leave in a few years, and so were the Russians, and the Russians did leave in 1948, and we left immediately thereafter, you see. But secret negotiations were going on in 1949 with the Russians, with the new North Korean leader, Kim Il-sung, and Stalin gave Kim Il-sung permission to invade the South. And um, so now you had North Korea, which was a communist country. You had China, neighboring Korea, with a border, and then uh, which was a co completely communist country. And then you had Russia, which was a completely communist country. You see, so the North Koreans had permission, literally, to go ahead and have a surprise invasion over the 38th parallel into South Korea. And they'd probably get away with overwhelming the Southern forces. The United States had now left. And the goal, of course, was to unify the continent, or rather the peninsula, under communist rule. And that's exactly what they did. And um, that created a crisis, of course. And the crisis was, well, Harry Truman, who was the president, knew that if you allow the North Koreans to get away with that, to Harry in Harry Truman's mind, it would have been the same as the mistake that Neville Chamberlain made against Hitler in 1938 for letting Neville Chamberlain say okay to Hitler, go ahead and take Czechoslovakia and then it's not worth having a war, you see? So Harry Truman was not gonna make that mistake. He was gonna stand up to the communists. And so now we had something called the United Nations though. And the United Nations had a feature to it that the organization that existed after World War I, which was supposed to do the job of the peacekeeping, the League of Nations, the United Nations had a provision in it where you can actually take armed force via the United Nations Security Council to actually push back an aggressor. And this certainly fit the bill because you have one country invading another country which is internationally legal. So the United Nations Security Council convened. And it was able to say that the North Koreans were in violation and that authorization was used, was given by the United Nations to push North Korean forces back over the 38th parallel. And that is why most people refer to Korea as a police action, you see? The idea was that we are mandated now to push the North Koreans over the 38th parallel from which they had come. So one of the big questions is if Russia is a charter member of the United Nations and any charter member has immediate veto power, then why didn't, why didn't Russia just veto the UN Security Council measure to push back against North Korea. And the answer is that Russia was not there at the United Nations. Russia was in the process of boycotting the United Nations. And the reason is because the United States 
would not recognize the communist government, the newly formed communist government under Mao Zedong in China and, and protest the Russians walked out of the United Nations because the United States would not recognize the new communist government of China. So I just want to show you the timing here, how timing is so important. And at that one moment where North Korea invades South Korea, Russia wouldn't wasn't even there to boycott, or not to boycott, but to veto rather, the Security Council resolution authorizing United Nations forces to push the communists back over the 38th parallel. That's the only reason why it passed. You know, like history would have been completely different if it had not been that one little quirk at that one specific time. And uh, so as it turns out, Douglas MacArthur, who was in the, you know, who was busy being the, I don't know, basically the president of Japan since 1945, was pulled in uh, and um, he became the commander of the United States and United Nations forces that were going to be this coalition force. It's a new term, coalition force, that was going to push the North Koreans back over the 38th parallel. And that's how the Korean War started. Um, so the North Koreans had actually pushed the coalition forces, which were woefully inadequate all the way down to the southeastern portion of the peninsula, down to a place called Pusan. And, um, and then uh, Douglas MacArthur brilliantly made this amphibious landing, landing behind Seoul on the, western, on the western part of the continent, or rather peninsula. And then Douglas MacArthur actually, under his leadership, the North Koreans were not only pushed back over the 38th parallel, but MacArthur actually pushed all the way to the top of North Korea, to the Chinese border, triggering a counter attack by the Chinese. And now we were at war with the Chinese. And uh, so uh, in another story, I'll tell you about the Korean War and how Douglas MacArthur actually was running his own foreign policy, where he had no problem triggering literally a general war with the Chinese, even if it meant the use of nuclear weapons. Because Douglas MacArthur, who had been in the Pacific since the 1930s, felt that it was a travesty that Harry Truman and the American government had let communist Chinese go communist. And, he, and Douglas MacArthur, wanted to reinstate after he has vanquished the Chinese, the communist Chinese, he wanted to reinstate the Chinese nationalists. And um, he was ready to trigger a general war to do it. Make a long story short, Doug, uh, Douglas MacArthur gets fired by Harry Truman for insubordination. So uh, this marks a uh, an arms buildup and a renewed emphasis on the military aspect of the fact that we now have to have a ready posture against the communists at all times, right? After World War II, it seemed as though we can go back to having a peace dividend. But after Korea, we must have, we had to maintain a constant force posture all around the world against the emergence of communism. And that is the certainly the way I grew up when all of that was going on. And we always had the Strategic Air Command flying around, and we always had the Seventh Fleet out in the Pacific, and we always had all of these things, which eventually, um, in his farewell address to the nation, Dwight Eisenhower referred to as the military-industrial complex, you see, which is something that we live with right to this day and the same concerns about the relationship between government and business interests in this regard. Um, um, but it begins a new era right here. And we're so used to it, we don't even know it. You know, it's just it's just business as usual. Um, 
the Korean War ends with um, an armistice. Right. The after the fighting is is really mostly the first year as far as moving back and forth. The two last two years, 1952, 1953, the border is is essentially the same and nobody's really moving. But it's a lot of people getting killed because while these peace negotiations are going on, there's a tremendous slaughter all over the place. OK, so 1953, there is an armistice, which is just an armistice. An armistice is a ceasefire. There was never a treaty. There was never a an end to the war. The North Koreans today consider themselves to be fully engaged in an active war with the United States of America because there was never a treaty. There was just a ceasefire. And something very important to understand. It's amazing. It's lasted all of these years in this kind of like, you know, grinding, I wouldn't call it a stalemate, but the North Koreans, I guess, are figuring that, you know, they're going to grind away at it and they're eventually going to have nuclear weapons and then we're going to have to treat them better. Um, and that would be a reasonable assumption on their part. And that's where we are right now with it. The Marshall Plan is something that really takes a lot of energy and is a model uh, of American relief effort in Europe in especially the late 1940s, early 1950s. Um, Western Europe by 1955, and I mean from West Germany to England, is essentially recovered from World War II. Um, and that is a marked difference between that delineation point where the Iron Curtain is and the Iron Curtain countries were the Warsaw Pact countries, the ones that are the Soviet satellites. And um, because Stalin had refused to allow the Soviet satellite countries to accept $1 of Marshall Plan money because the Soviet Union was in an, like this ego battle with the United States, if you will. And you one side had to show the Russians had to show that communism was a superior system of society and government than capitalism was. So therefore, why do we need capitalistic money? We're going to show you that you can live better under communist rule and not capitalist rule. And so Stalin forbade it. But there became this enormous contrast. I and mean, people, especially in Europe, I mean, in Germany, rather, in Eastern Germany, you had I don't know, your brother, or your cousin Hans or whoever it was who was living in West Germany was prosperous. And in 1955, you're over there in Eastern Germany and there's still piles of bricks around from 1945, you know, and um, it was becoming a real problem for Stalin. Now, as it turns out, Stalin uh, had passed away in 1953. And then you have a new communist rule, which changes the entire the entire equation, right? You had after this kind of like power struggle to get to the top fight, you wound up with a guy named Nikita Khrushchev. And Nikita Khrushchev had to, I mean, he was walking on eggshells within his own country because he had to prove himself to be to two sides of his own politics. One hand, he had to be a stalwart communist, right? And at the other hand, he had to modernize Russia to the point where you can bring to the worldwide public Soviet communism so everyone would see that Soviet communism was something that you sh should invest in. And so he had to soften the, the Stalinist stance. And they went into a period of something called anti-Stalinization. And what that means is that Khrushchev had to buck the hardliners in his party who loved Stalin or, you know, it, it, I'm not saying loved Stalin. Listen, if you grew up in this situation under Stalin, you were like, yeah, you loved Stalin, because if you didn't love Stalin, you were going to be gone in about an hour, you know, and so was your family. So that's the way it was there. Now, what Khrushchev wanted to do is he wanted to take all of these emerging countries around the world 
that were no longer under the yoke of colonialism because of the end of World War II, a lot of the colonial powers, the traditional ones, had given up their colonial hold, particularly Great Britain. And so you had these countries um, who were saying, okay, well, we need help with technology. We need help with government. We need medical care. We need education, right? And there were two stores on the street. There was the United States in the West, and there was Russia. And we were trying to appeal to get people on board with us. And then we would invest money in them. And then they would be, they would be, I guess, on our side, you know. And the Russians were trying to do the same thing. So whoever seemed more you know, the better investment. Like, who do you want to get on board with? You want to get on board with the loser or the upcoming country, the one that's always going to be there, right? We have the same exact argument now. It is literally a parallel in this day to day between what the Chinese doing in their foreign policy with their Belt and Road Initiative that we had in the early 1950s, right? The Chinese are making the argument to countries that need assistance, technology, whatever, and saying, listen, the United States is a declining power. We're an ascending power. Who do you want to hitch your wagon to? You see, it's just that simple. And in the 1950s, it was the Russians or it was us, right? Eventually, in 1960-61, the Russians had to uh, have the Germans build in Berlin, a wall to keep their own people from going out to the West. All right. And that's something we'll talk about, of course, next time when we do the, the 1960s. We'll talk about the Berlin Wall. Uh, but this was a tremendous tension. And it was only because of our relative isolated affluence here in this country. You know, unless you were involved in this, you didn't really know it. You didn't really know it. Even in the 1960s, when I was, you know, whatever, a, um, a grade school child, um, it was, it was, you know, 9.15 in the morning on Fridays, the air raid siren went off. You had all of the buildings that were around, all had air raid shelters, fallout shelters, um, civil defense equipment, all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's hard to even remember this now, but that was a pretty big deal during the day. And uh, the Marshall Plan caused a lot of tension. Another thing, by 2024 standards, right, sociologically, if you're looking at, or geopolitically, but sociologically, kind of like in the, in the form of social justice, if you're looking at the excesses that the United States had as far as our foreign uh, call it colonialism if you want, All right? There's this thing called economic and cultural uh, colonialism, which means that in the Marshall Plan fits under this, right? And I'm just telling you this because this is the way it's perceived now by many, many people, it's certainly in my field, is that the United States had overdone its imprint on the world by its benevolence after World War II which was really just disguised to get the world hooked on American products. And so the United States to have, an, have another excuse of stepping on, I don't know, indigenous cultures and replacing them with ours, you see. Uh, you know, and if you're somebody who thinks about the United States that way, this fits your bill. And you're like, yeah, the United States, they push their way into Germany. They push their way into France. And, you know, when people in Bangkok are drinking Coca-Cola instead of what people in Bangkok used to drink, which must have been better than Coca-Cola. Right. It's um, this is the period of time where in one place you were thinking that you're doing something good. By bringing medicine, by bringing food, by bringing even ge genetically modified uh, organisms, GMOs, because they'll last longer and they'll feed more people. At one time, that was considered, it was considered a miracle of feeding the world. I mean, by today's standards, it's, well, I'm not eating that. 
And we've poisoned other cultures by our desire to be rabidly greedy. You see how things have changed in a very short amount of time? Um, and I just like to point these things out. One thing that happened that the Russians put together was their own space program. All right, it scared the hell out of us, and it should have. Uh, this didn't happen until, you know, mid-1950s. And so in 1957, the summer of, uh, the Russians put this thing up in space. And it surprised us because we didn't think they had the capability. And it was this gadget called Sputnik, right? It was this little satellite, probably around, I don't know. It's about, I don't know how big it was. It looked like it's the size of a basketball or something. I, I can't be sure. And it had these antennas on them that was silver. And, and it was the first artificial satellite in Earth's orbit. You see, now from a military standpoint, from a political standpoint, what was scary about this wasn't that the Russians had this little gadget up there that people were tuning in their transistor radios to and it was beeping or you were out there with your dad with the telescope in the dark backyard and you saw this thing go by, which I understand in some places you could do. It was that the Russians had successfully with their German scientists from the end of World War II, by the way. The Russians had successfully, for the first time, developed the um, successful technology and implementation of that technology to put something in precise orbit, which is not an easy thing to do. Okay, you needed like a three-stage rocket to do it, and that is, it exceeded our capability, which from an American standpoint you know i mean we like to think that we are always ahead of that stuff right and it was it shook everybody up and it was a real black eye to our ego and everything else but besides that it was it meant that the russians if they could if the russians could military can miniaturize a nuclear warhead which they already had in 1949 by the way if they could miniaturize a nuclear warhead what sputnik meant was that instead of Sputnik being on the top of that rocket, a miniature nuclear warhead could be on top of that rocket. And the Russians could just as easily and just as accurately, presumably, shoot that thing from Siberia over the North Pole, over Canada, and land right on Washington, D.C. or something like that, or some military target. That's what it meant. So the entire space program was that we had was in response to this. And we created NASA, right? The National Aeronautic and Space what, Association. And, and we created NASA for this, you know, for the, for consumption um, uh, aim of, you know, peaceful, you know, peaceful existence in space by putting up, you know, John Glenn and those other guys who were up in the early orbits in 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 space. And really, the whole thing was is develop a missile program, and the the missiles that were being used for to launch our Mercury capsules and our Gemini, Gemini capsules were really military rockets. You see, because we sucked at it, we our our rockets were crashing on the launching pad, and uh, so. By launching NASA, we were able to actually perfect our rocket systems so that we could put miniaturized nuclear warheads on top of them. You see, um, during the election of 1960, uh, the Kennedy campaign ran on a platform of criticizing the Eisenhower campaign because the Eisenhower campaign, the narrative went, had been asleep at the switch and had allowed the Russians to gain prominence in space technology and therefore missile technology. And uh, it's hard to say that that was false. And of course, the vice president from Eisenhower, uh, which was Richard Nixon, was the person who was going to be running against Kennedy. So an attack on the Eisenhower administration was an attack on your political opponent who was running for the 1960 election. So that's how NASA 
got launched, right? And it was in response to Sputnik. Another thing we did in 1958 in response to Sputnik is to put the spotlight back on the United States as by being technically superior to the Russians was we took our first nuclear submarine and that was built right in electric boat company right here in Connecticut, the USS Nautilus, which was launched in 1954. And this nuclear submarine, what we did was we sent it up through the Bering Strait between Russia and, uh, and uh, the Aleutian Islands, Alaska, and found its way under the polar ice cap and actually sailed under the polar ice cap all the way to the other side of the world and came out by Greenland. And then the Nautilus went down to Portsmouth, England, and it actually surfaced. Okay, so that became a major, a major technological advancement that caught the world's attention that, I mean, you know, that was a, that was like a moonshot back in those days, traveling, submerged, right, from basically Pearl Harbor to um, England over the top of the earth. And I mean, that was the stuff of fantasy. And so to try and recapture the world's attention about the prowess of American technology. This was something that we had been ahead of the Russians in as far as nuclear energy and submarines. And, um, and so that was a big deal. Now, speaking of nuclear energy and submarines, um, I did a program at uh, Westport, uh, I guess it was, I don't know, last week or something, on the on Hyman G. Rickover, uh, which is a whole subject in itself. But the United States was developing safe means of um, using nuclear energy, atomic energy, for the propulsion of ships and also for civilian use reactors to create electricity, you see? And uh, that was another thing in the 1950s that looked very, very promising and remained very, very promising until the 1970s when you had a couple of nuclear accidents two particularly one in the 70s one in the 80s you had chernobyl and i think it was 83 and of course in the united states you had three mile island which if memory serves was in 1979 and that literally scared the hell of, out of any everybody you know and every permit that was issued for a nuclear power plant was immediately frozen and in the image of nuclear power never really recovered as a safe means of of, of uh, energy production. There's still something on the table for discussion when we're trying to find viable alternative forms of energy. You know, ones that don't use oxygen, which of course is necessary in a submarine, or to give off any kind of uh, greenhouse gases in its while it's producing energy right you know of course nuclear energy yields spent fuel uh and that's another story uh our program today isn't about nuclear energy and nuclear waste but it is something that is it seemed it was the stuff of dreams uh in the 1950s and and before the nautilus was launched i mean the only thing that anybody ever thought of when you thought of atomic energy was a bomb Right. But the, if you could harness it and you could contain it and you could control nuclear fission, well, it's the power of the universe. It was a pretty big deal in the 1950s. I mean, you know, just looking at myself, I think there's a certain amount of things like this that one is jaded upon because you take it for granted because you grew up with it and it exists. So, you know, yeah, it's there. But when these things first occurred, I mean, they were huge advances. Transistors. Transistors. Right? I've got these radios around. I like antique things, you know. I had this radio. I got this radio down in my basement right 
now. I don't have a time for it here to, to rebuild it. But, you know, it's one of these old radios that people would have in their living room. And that one happens to be, it's a Philco, I think, and it's Art Deco. You know, when it's this, you know what I'm talking about, these big old things with the dial. And um, I've got a smaller one right over here in my office and it belonged to my uh, my wife's grandmother when cleaning out her house. This thing was in the basement and it was in pretty good shape. It's a desktop radio, right? It's a Philco. And they had two kinds. They had the cathedral, which came to a point. This one is called the tombstone, right? Because it, it sort of fits a different shape and they called it the tombstone. But I brought it to a radio shop and they had to replace some of the capacitors or whatever it is. And I redid the cabinet myself and the speaker's still the original and everything else like that. And, and I was messing around with this thing and I hooked up this long antenna all the way down the hallway. And at 11 o'clock at night, I'm sitting here and we're at, I'm at, at my desk in Connecticut and I'm picking up radio stations that are halfway around the country. And I'm sitting next to my computer, the computer I'm using now, and I'm listening to the call signs and I'm typing in. And um, I'm like, where the hell is this? W or K something, right? And uh, it's just incredible how far this picked up. Uh, it was receiving radio signals. Now, you know, to me, it's, you know, it was just a, it's just, just a novelty. But if you think about people in the early days of radio or even television for that matter, and you consider like how remarkable this was to be connected to the rest of the world, right? And to be able to have this kind of achievement and um, transistors made that portable, right? Portable. And my grandfather used to have uh he used to have this little radio, right? This my father gave him. And it took a nine volt battery, and he, my grandfather used to listen to the Yankees games. And he had the thing up by his ear, you know. And it was just this little tiny radio, and it was just absolutely remarkable that you, you can have what used to have to be this huge thing with tubes that were had to heat up, and uh, now you had this little tiny thing to do the same thing. Now I was working on old chips. Um, well, these big old radios, World, World War II, et cetera, 1950s, and they had, it was pre-transistor, and they had these enormous tubes, and it was just, they weighed a ton. Uh, now, of course, everything is completely computerized, and I'm walking around, and so were you, with smartphones. That is a complete bonafide computer, which in the old days, even with computers, even with transistors in the 1950s and 60s would have still taken up an entire room and your smartphone has more computing cap capacity now so the whole idea of computers and transistors and memory space is something that if you're into it we can't it, it is just it's incredible what is involved here and that all started in the 1950s with semiconductors and diodes and uh, what we today call um, affectionately or not so affectionately Silicon Valley based on the primary material that is used in semiconductors, silicon. Um, no, the hydrogen bomb. As I said to you before, the Russians had developed nuclear weapons when they had a lot of spies and of course in our um, Manhattan Project and subsequent iterations of the Manhattan Project. So the Russians' first bomb, their plutonium bomb, um, not surprisingly, was a carbon copy of our plutonium bomb, right? And so it, we weren't going to sit still and allow the Russians have the same bomb that we have. So our guys went out and they created the next generation of nuclear weapons, which was called the hydrogen bomb. Right. Uh, otherwise referred to as a thermonuclear weapon. And the hydrogen bomb kept getting bigger because after we developed the hydrogen bomb, well, then the Russians, of course, they came up with uh, their own hydrogen bomb. And then we created a bigger hydrogen bomb than their hydrogen bomb. Right. And then the Russians created a bigger one than ours. I mean, and the whole thing became, you know, it's it's insanity. Right. And everybody, this is the first time, even the Russians, 
were saying, look, this is insane. You know, what are we going to do? We're going to split the earth in half, you know, and it became it became obvious. And this is the period of time where I grew up as a child, you know, and, you know, my favorite show was I've told you this before was Twilight Zone and the Twilight Zone reflected this kind of madness. It reflected this kind of madness, which was really a part of our daily existence in the background. And that was the whole point of the Twilight Zone from my standpoint. You know, you always had these episodes where these guys were in the basement or whatever, and somehow you managed not to get killed. And then you like crawled through the bricks and there was nobody left on Earth but you. You know, that sort of a thing. Everything was around like this nuclear Armageddon or the potential of it or the aftermath of it. Or And then uh, my favorites were, well, not my favorites, but it's interesting, is like those Godzilla movies, right, that the Japanese used to make. You know, where you've got these giant sea creatures that were were these dormant eggs that became uh, that that became active because of nuclear radiation. Right. As a result of all of these bombs going off. Um, for those of you old enough to remember this, I mean, you know, it's easy to forget, but this was a real this was a real feature of life. And it seemed all too real for at least, you know the the environment that I was in right not that I felt like I was going to get blown up but everybody kind of knew that it was a possibility right so the hydrogen bomb and another factor we have about the hydrogen bomb is that from today's standpoint from the standpoint of 2024 we have to ask the question uh the very, very real question about you know we we exploded literally hundreds of things maybe thousands in tests all over the place and you had all of this downwind radiation right and what effect did that have on whoever and whatever you see and then we finally now are going uh, we went underground with tests with the assumption that somehow that was less polluting if we exploded nuclear bombs in the earth than in the atmosphere I don't know. I'll let somebody else figure that out. Um, I did a program uh, just recently for a military audience, or at least a veteran's audience, and it was called um, Operation Crossroads about the atomic bomb tests out in the Bikini Atoll, uh, Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. Um, and yes, that's where the term bikini comes from, by the way. I'll tell you another story over a beer sometime. And the 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 notion is that we had to talk these islanders out of their community their lagoon and said yeah yeah don't worry we're just going to have some tests here and then you can come back and of course they couldn't come back because the place was like totally irradiated right so that's another example of uh by today's standards american excess and how we left in an, uh, a disproportionate footprint on peoples who essentially were exploited right so, um, also in the 1950s uh, was our highway system was developed, right? This big highway system, right? I-95, I-84, I-80, and all the rest of this stuff. I mean, all considered part of the, what we now refer to as the Eisenhower interstate system. And around 1991, 1992, that entire system of roads in the United States, not the old system of roads, not Route 1, Route 9, Route 7, not that. I'm talking about the big highways. That was actually attributed to uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, and the whole system was named after him. Maybe you've seen a sign on one of these highways. Um, and it's like a blue sign that's square, and it says Eisenhower Interstate System, and it's got five stars on it. Uh, reflecting the fact that Eisenhower was a five-star general, right? Not that he did this when he was a general. He did it when he was president of the United States. But um, the Eisenhower interstate system is generally referred to as something of a massive infrastructure project, what we, today we would call infrastructure spending, for the standpoint of the federal government investing in, I don't know, the national economy and a massive put people to work sort of a program, right? Now, the genesis of this was Eisenhower being um, on a little expedition in 1919 after World War One, 
where the United States government realizing and the military realizing that we were in a mechanized world now, having just spent a year in World War I with trucks and airplanes and tanks and everything being run around by motor vehicles. What happened if the United States got attacked? I mean, would we be able to even bring supplies from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States or vice versa? And the answer was no. We had no infrastructure whatsoever. I mean, most of the roads back in those days were dirt roads or makeshift affairs. And as soon as you had some weather event happen, it was washed out. So from the standpoint of the military, um, we started creating the first series of national highways, right? which are the old highway system, Boston Post Road, Route 9, Route 7, Route 9A, right? Route 8, right? all the rest of that. And um, when Eisenhower was the commanding general of the Western Allied Forces in World War II, the United States, as we had entered Germany by 1945, we were using something that the Nazis had developed in their own work program in the 1930s, which we referred to as the Autobahn, right? So there's Eisenhower who would realize the deficiency of the United States road system only 20 years earlier. And he's looking at the Autobahn and we're using it to enter Germany and to, you know, this, that, and the other thing. I mean, it was the first standardized highway system. And he said, this is it. This is what we need. So when he became president, um, he put together these plans to have a national highway system based essentially on the Autobahn. And what we had learned from the end of World War II Right, we a lot of studies was done, tremendous amount of study done at places like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? Because those are the only two atomic bombs which were actually used on a civilian population. Um, and so most of the people who died from those blasts, the first one a uranium blast, the second one a plutonium blast, right? Uh, most of them died not as a result of the initial blast, but the result of the results of not being able to get the hell out of there. And people died of radiation sickness. They had no water to drink that wasn't contaminated. They had no food to drink that wasn't contaminated. Everything was contaminated. So you couldn't get supplies in and you couldn't get people out. Right. So that lesson was now learned in our own situation here with those thermonuclear weapons that I was just telling you about. And we were like, listen, we half the city is in the United States and all of the military installations are hard targets by the Soviets, who, as I mentioned earlier, have now the likely capacity to shoot one of their damn missiles, their intercontinental ballistic missiles over the North Pole, over Canada and right to one of our military installations, you see, or one of our major cities, New York City, Philadelphia, presumably, I don't know, and Washington, D.C. So the idea is that if you don't want to create another Hiroshima with everybody dying, um, because you can't get out of there and you can't get medical supplies and fresh water and things in, you need to have some kind of a massive highway system to be able to facilitate that kind of transportation under the worst kinds of conditions. And that was the genesis of the defense system, which became the international highway, the, um, the interstate highway system. It was actually a defense project. And um, so this way, I mean, you'll even notice uh, this. Uh, if you go, if you take I-95 um, to New London, right? For those of you familiar with that area, and you sure you must, Connecticut's not that big. If you're headed towards Rhode Island or whatever, I mean, I used to go up to the Naval, uh, to the um, to the Coast Guard Academy, and um, and I've also had business in my previous career up in the the uh, submarine base, right, uh, both on the Thames River, of course, right, on the west and east side, respectively, and of course, electric boat company. Right now, Electric Boat Company, and here's my point, Electric Boat Company on the Thames River is um, 
is only one out of two places in the entire United States that is able that is capable of either building or repairing nuclear submarines. Only one of two places, right? The other place being Norfolk, Virginia, right? So it's understood that both Electric Boat Company and the Norfolk Naval Base, right, or Newport News Shipbuilding, I should say, are both hard targets for Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles, right? Because if you take out our ability to build and repair, especially repair nuclear submarines, that takes away the single largest threat to any of our adversaries. So if you, to my point, if you're traveling along I-95, which is really sort of like an east-west affair there, but of course it's considered north if you're traveling towards um, Rhode Island, you'll notice that the Gold Star Memorial Bridge, right, which is the southbound and the northbound part of I-95, they're enormous bridges. They're enormous. They're very, very high. And they're also very, very, very wide. And there's two of them. And they're massively built. Now, you compare that to any other bridges going over any of the rivers uh, on 95. And they're, they dwarf any other river uh, bridges by comparison. And the reason is because of what I just told you, is because it's suspected that the electric boat company and, and uh, our ability to repair submarines or build submarines is a likely target in a nuclear exchange. So therefore the bridges are built to withstand a higher level of stress, potentially being damaged. That's why there's two of them. In case one of them gets knocked out, there's still the other. You see what I'm getting at? It's a military system. <laughs> television. How did television change the world? I used to sit on the TV watching, sit on the floor watching TV in the 1960s, right? We still had this damn black and white TV because my father was like, we're not getting a color TV until this one breaks. And everybody knows that this thing ain't never going to break. You know what I mean? You, you could hit this, you could beat it with a sledgehammer, this Philco, whatever that was, wouldn't break, you know? So, and if something went, if it stopped working, you just had to go and see which tube didn't work and replace it. You all know what I'm talking about. So anyway, but television, uh, my grandparents, right, I guess who were in, you know, saw themselves as adults in the age of radio, they, their thing was, well, all of you kids watching television, your mind is going to be ruined, you see, right, which I guess every generation has their thing, right? Now, you know, people my age look at people who are on, who are addicted to social media, and I'm thinking, I'll bet you their mind is going to be ruined, you know, so uh, who's right? Who's wrong? Maybe, maybe both were right. Uh, I mean, you know, I grew up watching all of these brilliant shows besides the Twilight Zone, like um, what? Gilligan's Island, you know? So maybe my mind is ruined. I don't know. I'll leave that to you. So, uh, but television, I mean, God, you know, the power of this is just incredible. It's just incredible. You know, speaking of politics and electoral politics, et cetera, um, it's uh, widely understood uh, that had that the election of 1960 with John F. Kennedy may actually have had a completely different result had the debates between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy had not been the first televised debates, right? Had, if they had been on the radio, would Richard Nixon had been considered to have more of a, I don't know, a grasp? of international affairs or something but it didn't matter but because the visual was there you had the handsome young relatively young john f kennedy right thin full head of hair you know uh i understand that women found him attractive i'll leave that to you and then you had this richard nixon which was like you know he sweating like a cartoon character he refused to wear makeup because men didn't wear makeup and he looked horrible you know, and so the visual impact of things became a whole new dimension as far as our regular lives, as far as what things seem like, what they're made to seem like, advertising, you know, uh, et cetera. So uh, television, I would like to think, changed our lives, right? TV 
I'm watching a lot of these old shows. I really don't care for a lot of the new programming. So sometimes I'll watch these, you know, these these old TV shows like, you know, Adam 12 or Dragnet and you know, that sort of a thing. I don't know. I like it. It was a different era. It was a different era and everybody was serious and it was, it was just different. Um, so the polio vaccine, right? Again, something I completely take for granted. Complete. I mean, when did I ever think about polio? When I'm doing a program on Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I say, "Oh yeah, FDR had polio," right? But but I am glad for one. I never had any personal experience with it. But had I been born twenty years earlier, I probably might have. Not even. Personally, potentially, I suppose, but certainly from people around me, this was something that uh, I was one of these kids in the 1960s, right? And, you know, I don't know when I was, when was I in, I was in like first grade in 1965 or some such thing. I don't know. And, um, and, you know, they had us lined up down the hallway, you know, and just, you had these shots, you know, and that weird round one, remember the weird round one with the little dots in it that was in my arm for like 30 years, uh, you could still see it. Um, I think that was rubella, whatever it was. But I would like to think that that was a positive thing, that um, at least the generation of people that accompanied me was didn't have to worry about these things. What happened was 40 years later, a lot of people my age were complaining that their parents had had them vaccinated because now, you know, vaccinations caused all of these horrible things. Right. You know, because people who are my age and they're shopping at Whole Foods, not to knock Whole Foods, I shop at Whole Foods. But in other words, we're a naturopath now. And my parents had me to the dentist and they put in these, I don't know, amalgam films or whatever they were. And they poisoned me. Right. And uh, all the rest of these things. So a lot of people my age became these kind of these naturopaths who blame their parents. Now, I personally never felt that way. I was sort of grateful. You know, my parents had some faults, but this wasn't one of them. They always tried to make sure we had the best health care. Um, so, yeah, the polio vaccine. And what else we have here? How about Crick and Watson discovering the double helix? Wow. These guys must have been brilliant, right? And DNA and everything else. You know, remember I was telling you about those old TV programs that I was watching, you know, police work and all the rest of that. And, you know, the best that they could do was match your blood type to something that was at the crime scene. I mean, now, I mean, if you take a sip off of a straw or something, they could take the straw and they can actually have your entire DNA profile. And uh, the kind of life that we live today, where if you want to go to those 23andMe things or have your ancestry checked, that is literally check change society about your ability to know your actual ancestors or imagine being in a situation where you know you get a phone call or something like that and you were a sperm donor because you were like down and out and didn't have five dollars to your name so you decide to go to the clinic and make twenty dollars by donating sperm and then you find out you got five kids or something like that i mean these these are things that you have literally changed society and um, um, uh, people who are finding their original birth parents and things like that. It, 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 sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a nightmare. Um, but the ability to have DNA as we know it today is unbelievable. And it was just a pipe dream beforehand. So, and finally, society in the standpoint of popular society in other words music and culture right what was going on during the 1950s now i remember this from the 1960s i'll talk about it later right but um because i had already been born into the age of essentially rock and roll and um but i can imagine what this must have been like for young people in the 1950s because 1950s is generally in a stereotypical sense is seen as a very conformist time. You see, you conform. It was kind of going back to a period of normalcy after uh, World War II, right? And we're going to have good values and, right, we're not going to let 
the wrong people into our country club and we're going to be driving the right car and we're going to be chasing affluence and keeping up with the Joneses. I mean, there are positive aspects to this and there are negative aspects to this, aren't there? And uh, the church attendance was much greater, right? Whether it be synagogue or church, um, it was it was still a, a feature of American life in the 1950s, right? You know, I was watching uh, the way people dressed and everything else like that and the women's roles and expectations. Two days ago, I did a program. Actually, I'm going to do it tonight. Uh, I've got this. This is my second presentation of the day. I've got one right after this in Darien. And I'm going to be talking about Susan B. Anthony. And, um, you know, maybe in the future we could do something like that. Uh, it's Women's History Month. So the the point is, is that even in the 1950s, you know, compared to right now, I mean, what was women's lives like? Not to say that it was horrible or they were out tilling the fields or something like that. But, you know, I mean, if you were if I said to my wife, I want you to put on a dress like Donna Reed and a little apron and walk around the house in high heels. And when I felt like having sex, you were going to give it to me whether you wanted it or not. I mean, you know what? I don't think that would fly very well. And um, but. In the 1950s, uh, not to say that every relationship was like that, but certainly the expectations were there still, if not vestigially. Um, I mean, I know my father, who is uh, obviously only one generation away from me, and uh, he was kind of a misogynist, you know, he was kind of a misogynist. And women had their roles and men had their roles. And, you know, I got to see that right up front. Right. My father's only been gone for three years, three years and he never really changed, you know. And uh, so that's not that far away in our collective memory, you know. But the 1950s also gave us um, the suburban home as we, you know, generally know it now. I mean, the home I'm in right now is is kind of like a, a home that was built on a tract of what was probably just wilderness up here by Cranberry Park in Norwalk. And, and uh, I don't want to call it wilderness because this isn't exactly wilderness, but there was nothing up here. It was just woods, right? And the house was built in 1959 in a sleek sort of ranch style, right? And wow, a lot of people getting out of the city. Um, a great story would be one about Levittown and how these onion fields out in Long Island and places around Philadelphia and Pennsylvania were actually just converted in mass to these individual uh, like Cape Cod style homes, right? And then later on, larger houses, uh, not much different than the one I'm living in now, I suppose. And, but what a dream to have. I mean, the people who were buying these houses uh, not different in age, perhaps, than than my father, who I just mentioned, who essentially grew up in the Great Depression and then fought World War II and then was called back for Korea. And then, you know what? You wanted to have something for yourself now. There's some stability. You have some money. You want to get out of the city. And um, you're going to go buy a house. And having this little house with this postage stamp size lawn was so important for a person's sense of accomplishment and a man was the head of his castle and it didn't matter how small it was it was his castle you know uh it changed society suburbia and it changed our transportation patterns our our uh independence about everybody had to get a car right and we were in a car culture now. We were in a car culture before, but it really went on steroids in the 1950s. And of course, gasoline was still like 20 cents a gallon, you know, <clears throat> all in the 1950s. As a matter of fact, I mean, I was speaking of the Eisenhower interstate system, and right? another good program would be somebody called Robert Moses, who was probably the most powerful person in New York City never had an elected position, right? But he was using federal funds to want to change the entire infrastructure of New York City to put these massive highways all over the place so to take advantage of the automobile. And the building that my parents were living in in the Bronx when I was very young was in the path of the Cross Bronx Expressway, right? 
And if you've never had the pleasure and you're feeling masochistic, go take a ride on the Cross Bronx Expressway. It's lovely. You'll love it. And But anyway, so the building was going to be slated to be torn down anyway. And that was my father's big move to go up to, you know, neighboring Westchester County, one click into Westchester County. Right. And uh, which is where I grew up over by Glen Island. And um, but, you know, all of these things change the dynamics of communities. They change the, the dynamic of 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 demographics. Right. That was a period. So was that white flight? Was my father moving away because a highway was going to be built where his apartment was? Or was he tired of people who didn't look like? Or maybe he just had the aspiration to finally get out of the city. You know, everybody's going to have to ask themselves that what question, what, what is the answer to that question, you see? Uh, but now you have, I mean, this is something that brings it right back to uh, the present day. You know, if you listen to our Secretary uh, of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, right, one of the goals of the Department of Transportation under this present administration, under his tenure, Pete Buttigieg, is to actually reunite communities that had been that had been um, cut in half by insensitive racial policies. Like, in other words, the highway, like the Cross Bronx Expressway, would probably be a good example, where you're going through an ethnic community and you're just sawing right through it because you want to put a road there, right? And you wouldn't do that. The argument would be through a white neighborhood. So therefore, from the standpoint of restorative justice, you have to go and find racist highways and you have to actually eliminate them and take them down to try to put the neighborhood back together. And that's restorative justice. Okay, you go listen to some of Pete Buttigieg's writings and speeches. You'll see what I mean. And uh, that what he's referring to is things that happened in the 1950s. Uh, as far as rock and roll is concerned, I mean, some of these 1950s musicians, et cetera, were just absolutely fabulous. You might have actually considered what this was like for people who were pretty straight laced. I mean, you know, black music, right, in the form of jazz, right? And you have the rhythmic impulses that people were afraid that your daughter was going to get into this rhythmic motion about rock and roll. And then obviously translated into uh, sexual promiscuity. And, you know, and that became a big problem, you know. So, uh, I mean, I even remember in the 1960s, <clears throat> my older brother's five years older than me. You know, he was a, he, he liked to play instruments. You know, he was talented for that sort of a thing and still plays the saxophone, as it turns out. But, um, but you had all of these traditionalists who were telling my brother, like who, you know, who was interested in rock and roll, of course, as was I, and saying, that's not really music. You know, real music. And of course, they went back to classical music, or I suppose they would have thought that something that Cole Porter wrote was classic, was traditional music and was okay somehow. But rock, rock and roll music was somehow, it was an aberration which just made people of my fault, my brother's generation and my generation just rebel, right? Because it seemed like ridiculous hypocrisy. <laughs> but of course, that was the era of, of rebellion also. Maybe every era was its own period of rebellion, but it became more, more vociferous, certainly during the 1960s. And the 1960s in this regard was built by the rebelliousness of the late 1950s. Right. You had these great movies and these things and these you had these like the Hell's Angels and things cropping up towards the end of the 1950s into the 1960s, which were just this very, very interesting bunch of people who were like, I don't know, did they fit in? Did they not fit in? They were renegades. Some of them were like former fighter pilots who had become so addicted to the adrenaline rush of like flying at 600 miles an hour is you just can't take them and just plunk them back into a uh, onto the sofa and put a, put a bowl of soup in front of them and expect them to be a family man. You see what I mean? So <clears throat> movies like The Wild One and all of these other kinds of movies and certainly um, things that were personified by Elvis Presley, you know what I mean? And 
Chuck Berry and all the rest of these things. Uh, how much of that was a threat because of the racial nature of it or the rhythmic stuff of it? Or it was just people who felt as though they knew what music meant and this new thing doesn't make any sense to me, so therefore I'm going to put it down. But the more that people from this era got put down, I mean, it was understood that there was a new generation coming up that was post-World War II that was going to be represented many of them by John F. Kennedy in the 1960s, right? Where we are just a new generation. We're not born in this century. And we are afraid that the world is going to blow itself up. And we are taking a completely different track. At Give peace a chance. And that is what we're going to explore in our next program in the 1960s, which is going to start off with once again, the space race and John F. Kennedy and how that shaped our nation for a decade. Um, thank you for joining me for an hour and a half. It's my pleasure discussing these things with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you again, Art, for your time. Uh, just real quick, does anyone have any questions for Art before we end the session? <clears throat> All right. If you do end up having any questions, you can go ahead and email me um, at the library and I can relay uh, any of those questions to Art um, if it's something that you want him to answer for you. Um, our next session will be on March 20th at 2 p.m. Um, if you missed any of the previous um, sessions from part one, they are up on our YouTube channel right now. This one will be going up soon as well in case you missed out in the beginning of the session. Um, thank you everyone again for coming out and we will see you all very soon. Thank you again, Art, and enjoy the rest of your day.